when I can step back from my work and be, you know, intentional about what I want to happen and then show up and be present when I am working, I find that while I do have, you know, quite a stressful job in some respects, it doesn't need to be as stressful. Hello, listeners. Today, my guest is Charlie Hartwell, and he is the managing partner of Bridge Builders Collaborative, a group of highly successful investors who have been investing in startup companies in the space of mental wellness, consciousness, and spirituality. That's their focus. They really take the time of investing in conscious mindfulness startups. He's a Harvard Business School graduate, and he has served and led organizations in 14 different industries, including starting a nonprofit in the slums of Kenya in 1986 that has now served healthcare to several million patients. He also founded the first for-profit expedition company in U.S. history to promote the Bancroft Arneson Expedition, which is an historical 17 thousand mile crossing of Antarctica by two women who became the first to cross the continent on foot. Now Charlie and his company are passionate about supporting the growth of a new movement around mental fitness, heart-centered connection, consciousness evolution, and improved healthcare. Bridge Builders has invested in such companies as Pair Therapeutics, Insight Timer, Headspace, Happify, and others. I'm sure you've heard of them. And I'm so grateful that Charlie joined me today to talk about how this work became important to him and how you can really be in touch with investing or just putting your time and effort in things that are meaningful to you and that you are in alignment with. We also talk about personal transformation and how sometimes as entrepreneurs, that's not really the thing that you're thinking about because it seems to be at the very bottom of the list. And he's got some really great insight into that. And I think it's really important to listen to, even if sometimes you think, eh, that can come later on. Well, think about some of that stuff because it could actually shift the entire way that you engage with the future things that you put your time into and your effort into, and of course, your money into. Lots of great things that we're covering today and enjoy. Charlie, thank you so much for hanging with me today. I'm so glad to get into our conversation, let our audience hear the that you have to share. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. I am too. Um, so I always like to start with a just a brief story of of the work that you're doing today and why why it means so much to you because it's definitely what you do is quite meaningful. Yes. Well, so many stories about me start with my wife, actually, who I call the wisdom of our family. She actually got me into the space of contemplative practice, mindfulness, uh, et cetera, I don't know, 10 or 11 years ago. And I got introduced to these investors nine years ago that formed something called the Bridge Builders Collaborative. And we're investing in startup companies in the space of mental health, consciousness, spirituality, mindfulness. We've been doing that for the last nine years. We were, we were kind of the first investors in that space, you know, the first serious investors in that space. So we've watched the space grow considerably over the last nine years. But I really credit my wife for, you know, for getting me into the space. That's awesome. What was it that, so she she was in this, this is some, this is something that she was in and then like persuaded you or influenced you? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. Because I think sometimes there's there's women that are involved in this and then to get their husbands to think that way and to open up their mind can be challenging. <laughs> so my wife's actually been a practitioner in this space for like 35 years. She's been, you know, psychotherapist, coach. She has been, you know, consultant to organizations, really about sort of, you know, help thing to transform, you know, people. And so, you know, as a yoga practitioner, mindfulness practitioner, and a social scientist, she's the one that got us involved in the Mind and Life Institute. The Mind and Life Institute was started about 40 years ago by a Stanford MBA, a Chilean neuroscientist, and the Dalai Lama. 
to actually, you know, help to fuel the movement to study contemplative practice and prove the benefits of contemplative practice. So I got introduced to the Mind and Life Institute because she was involved. And then, you know, that's where I get connected to these, you know, to the the investors that I, uh, that I've been working with for the last nine years. Awesome. So let's talk about Bridge Builders Collaborative. Tell us what this is, how it came together. And I want, I want to learn more about what it is (laughs) and, and what you're doing to actually change the world. So as someone passionate about co-creating global movements, you know, this is the latest global movement that I've been, you know, that I've been sort of associated with. And the reason is because, you know, as I was talking about the Mind and Life Institute, there were three guys, a guy named Jeff Walker, who was a former head of private equity for JP Morgan, a guy named Scott Krins, who was the founder of Juniper Networks out in the Bay Area, uh, and a guy named Austin Hurst from the Hearst Media family, who asked a question whether the science of contemplative practice had gotten to the point where there was anything that they could invest in to help bring that science to scale through entrepreneurs and for, you know, through startup investing. And, you know, they all lead really busy lives. They needed someone to answer that question for them. So I got connected to them and, you know, began and it's asking that question, whether there was any great entrepreneurs we could invest in to help, you know, bring this to global scale. And, you know, since then, we just added our, you know, our ninth investment partner. And we just, you know, completed our 15th investment in the space. And, in, and, and we've been really helping to change the world through bringing concepts like mindfulness, mind training, you know, behavioral health, things like digital therapeutics, you know, to, to scale so that we can help create a paradigm shift in how people connect to themselves and then hopefully a paradigm shift in healthcare because of that. Oh, awesome. So what was, what is your, like, what is this fulfilling for you? Oh, that's a great question. So my energy is all about growth, authentic leadership, you know, innovation and and transformation. And it's been that, that's just, you know, that's just who I am. I've always been that way. And so what this is fulfilling for me is a way that I can use all of my gifts to support entrepreneurship. And I've been an entrepreneur, so I understand, but also I'm passionate about building global movements. So I'm able to use my gifts of collaboration, connection, strategy, marketing to help find and support entrepreneurs who are building, you know, scalable businesses that help shift human consciousness. Does that that answer your question? It does answer my question, but now I have more. So (laughs) (laughs) let's, Let's, I want to talk about with, with you, you say that you've always, you know, been personal transformation has always been something that's been important to you. And there's some people that are just waking up to this idea. What is that? Like, what does that look for, look like for you on an ongoing basis? Because I'm assuming it's not just, I have this transformation. That's it. I'm transformed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what is <laughs> what what does that look like to you and what does you know being like what is your definition of being authentic yeah that's it okay so i'm going to try to unpack those in a couple of different ways okay. first of all i just want to say you know the energies you know the energies are, that i bring into the world have been since i was you know since i was young and so Whenever I seem to get involved in something, there's going to be change. And I have been involved in, you know, a few different sort of, you know, global movements. But my own journey to transformation began, you know, probably 15 years ago when when there was enough death uh, around me where, and I, you know, I realized I was suffering that I chose, you know, for the first time in my life to sort of seek help. So my father and grandfather had, you know, died within two years of each other. They were my role models. I'd always been successful in business. My first business was having, you know, was failing, or I was having my first business failure. And my marriage, which had been dead for years, I finally, you know, became awake 
uh, to the fact that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't authentic. And so, you know, amidst all of that, I, you know, I sought help and that wasn't really something even in my family system that we did. So I began to wake up to, you know, to the stories I'd been telling myself, the conditioning of my youth, um, the negative patterns in my family system, uh, the way that I had interacted with those, you know, I began to claim, you know, my own gifts. I found a singing voice that I didn't, you know, that I didn't know I had. I then produced two albums, uh, you know, I was writing music. I just, st- you know, I stopped trying to please people and sh- I started a process of just be- being my more authentic self. And, and in doing that, what I found was, you know, my, my gifts in business, my gifts of, you know, of leading, uh, which I'd always had, but they, they strengthened. And I was finding, I, I was more in t- touch with what my purpose was. So I began to explore what was more resonant, you know, to my purpose and, and to just begin to let, you know, lead a more authentic life. So I'll stop there uh, and see if if you have any more questions, but I, I hope that answers your question. No, it does. It definitely does. And, you know, what, so I guess I'm curious as to what are, what are things do, that you do consistently to maintain, I think you call it, if I remember reading it somewhere, you'll, you'll call it mental fitness. Am I, am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, words, yeah. And my, yeah, yeah. And that and that mindfulness. And it's something that's it's super it's it's very important to me as well. And but I notice that you know, especially entrepreneurs and you know, when you're when you're running a business, we can we can lose sight of that because you you get so involved in running the business. Uh, yeah. And, are we making money? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? That you can lose sight of the of that authenticity that is within you. And I guess kind of like my my questions are, you know, what what are the things that you do to truly stay in that in that state and also continuously learn more about yourself and and you know just keep keep that groundedness, I guess, is, is the word. <laughs> well, the first thing is I, I don't, I don't do any of this perfectly and it is a process over time. And again, I'm going to come back to my wife when I'm, when I'm not living there, I have a partner who loves me enough to kick me in the ass and, <laughs> and say, <laughs> you need, have you, have you thought about this? Are you changing this? Um, so I have, I have an accountability partner uh, named Maureen, but you know, what's interesting for me is, you know, I do have a practice, but I also am, am someone who likes to experiment, especially being in the field. I like to experiment with different practices. So uh, for instance, I use one of our investments is called, called Inside Timer. It's a platform of 7,500 leading spiritual teachers from around the world, connecting with a community of 17 million from, you know, and, and, and teachers teaching in 40 different languages. I use that every day, um, either just, you know, as a meditation tool or to seek insight or, you know, as a, as a way to connect with people. So, you know, so my goal is to, you know, is to meditate every day, but like for me being in nature is, is a way that I, you know, that I authentically connect. I also have used various, you know, modalities or practices. Part of that is like research that I do for, you know, for my work. And part of it is just, you know, I, I love exploring, you know, new methods of, of helping, you know, to improve my mental and physical wellness. So that can be everything from doing energy work with, um, with horses, you know, or equine therapy to, you know, to different forms of meditation, working with different practitioners, either, you know, like chiropractor massage therapist, but also combining energy work with that. So, I mean, there's a host of different practices that I have, and I really like experimenting with new ones. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm with you on that. Sometimes I, I will 
I have gotten to the point where I've overwhelmed myself because there's so many things I've, I've wanted to try. Then I'm like, wait a minute. Now, now I'm going backwards here. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Summer, let me just say one thing to your earlier point, you know, cause you were yeah. talking about entrepreneurs and, you know, and I, and I get it. You can get so sucked in to, we need to be profitable. What's, what's happening. You know, you can get so sucked into that, but if you really step away and this is a process that, you know, that I'm, you know, that I'm consistently needing to reinforce with myself, if you can step away and really tend to yourself and, and try to connect with something, you know, with, with whatever is sort of a, something greater than yourself, people can call that different things, but how do you allow something greater than yourself to actually support your work versus feeling like you always need to be the one doing that? And when I can step back from my work and be, you know, intentional about what I want to happen and then show up and be present when I am working, I find that while I do have, you know, quite a stressful job in some respects, it doesn't need to be as stressful. Yeah, no, that's so true. I I totally agree. Hey guys, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Backstage Business Podcast. I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by The Draw Shop. At The Draw Shop, we make animated videos that just work. Did you know that most businesses are struggling to increase their sales simply because they don't stand out? At The Draw Shop, we use a scientifically proven formula to create animated videos that just work. With customers such as Uber, Twitter, Google, United Nations, Lockheed Martin, Netflix, and more, we know that creating messages that are impossible to misunderstand, it's critical to attracting more customers and keeping your audience engaged so that you can stand out as the best in your industry. Find out more information at thedrawshop.com. Speaking of, okay, when you... Do you have a certain process when you decide who who you're going to work with, what you're going to invest in to make sure that it is in alignment with your with your greater vision? Absolutely. The first question I ask when I see a business plan is if this is successful and I can imagine the you know the sort of the greatest outcome, what change will we have made in the world? And you know, will we, imp- will we help to improve the, you know, the sort of either consciousness or spirituality or the mental health uh, of people on a global basis? The second question that I'll ask is really about who's the entrepreneur. And, and I ask the question for, you know, first sort of, is the entrepreneur somebody that's really done the work that they're trying to bring out into the world? So that they, have they really integrated the work that they're doing as opposed to doing the work instead of integrating, you know, as a way of expressing themselves. I find a lot of times if they haven't actually done the work, but they're really passionate about it, then their, their manifestation of that is not going to be as powerful as if, they, if they've actually integrated that work. Then I ask whether, are, are they collaborative? Will they be fun to work with? Are they a strong leader? Are they a collaborative leader? So that's sort of a next screen. Uh, then I then we you know sort of say if, if it, this product or service is there a need for it, and if there is a need for it, you know how do how can we how can we imagine that? What's the size of it? And then you know what's the competitive advantage that they bring or intellectual property they have to reinforce that? And then you know at the at the bottom of all that, then we will ask whether or not, you know, we can make a financial return. And, you know, and, and we try to model that out and say, if this is successful, then we'll, you know, we'll make a, this type of return on that, that investment. So it's, 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 it's not, you know, each company is, you know, is uniquely different, but that's a basic process that I go through. What are, what are some of the like biggest challenges you've had with companies that you've invested in? Mm, that's a good question. You're asking good questions. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I've just found in my, you know, in my life overall, I've worked with a lot of founders of businesses and I've been one myself. And one of the challenges is at what point is a founder of the business, does the founder of the business need to turn it over to someone else? And the answer to that question can sometimes be, 
not for a very, very long time. Somebody can begin, you know, can begin and, and also be the CEO at a very, you know, at a very, as a, as a big business. But there are other times when there are people that are uniquely qualified to bring a business to a certain level. And then for the best interest of the business, it's time to turn it over to someone that has more skill in scaling things. And that, that's a really hard process to go through on multiple levels to, when you get to that point. Because there's ego involved, there can, you know, you can, it, there can be a lot of coaching, can be a lot of hurt feelings, et cetera. That's a challenge. I think also I'm trying to think of, you know, of other challenges is, is how do you, in almost every case with our business, they start out with an idea and then how do you listen to the marketplace and listen so closely that you can really read when you need to pivot the business? So our most successful businesses are actually quite different than what we originally imagined, or they're in quite different distribution system, same product, but in quite different distribution system than we imagine them to be, if that makes sense. No, that's, and that's such a great point because I think that that happens a lot with, with businesses, how they start. What kind of, if, if, you, if you can share these, what kind of market research is being done in terms of determining, okay, this is actually what we really need to create, or this is what we really need to be doing in order to satisfy that, that problem that they have. I'm not sure I understand that. What, what market research do we do? What kind of market research, like what, what types of things do you do to determine we need to do this differently now? Like we, what, 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 what it started out as is now shifted and we've pivoted to now be this yeah, there's a company called Happify, which we invested when uh, it's a it's a platform that's built by two former gamers who learned about the science of cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and positive psychology. And they said, "Well, we don't really believe the science," but they they studied that and they said, "Well, as our next business, we can actually do this and make a much more positive impact on the world than our last business, which we just got people addicted to gaming." So yeah. they created Happify. There were 2 million consumer downloads of the product when we invested. And, and then people enjoyed the experience enough to where companies started to call them. And so we had a discussion about, okay, so how do you go after the corporate market? And then I made an introduction to them of a person that had, you know, was a CEO of a behavioral health company. And he said, well, my God, this is one of the best behavioral health innovations I've seen. So the company not only started looking at how can we support companies, but they sort of said, how do we start bringing this more into the healthcare system? So, so that meant starting to work with insurance companies. So when you're a gamer and you're learning how to sell to companies, which is a very long sales cycle, and then you start getting in, in, interested in and in, introduced to insurance companies, and you go through that process, so it's a quite a, a different business. And then on top of that, they began to learn through research that they that, that in using their product, people could have significant health benefits. And so they began to ask themselves the question, so what do we do about that? And they actually, you know, now are called, the company's called Happify Health. It has, still has a consumer platform. It still sells to major you know, Fortune 500 companies, smaller companies, insurance companies, but now it's actually going to be going through the FDA process to actually be a drug, you know, a component that that can work either with a an existing drug or perhaps be a drug on its own, prescribed and reimbursed. And, you know, if you think about software as a drug, you don't say, what chemical do I need to change my disease? You say, if I use this software, how do I reprogram my mind so that I don't have as much stress and, right. and depression, et cetera? So our excitement about this is if we can train people to get out of those states and not spend the healthcare costs associated with those states, then maybe we can have less reliance on drugs and people can be happier, healthier, and just in a better state of mind. So- you know, all of that is a huge learning to go from a consumer to, you know, to, to sort of a drug company uh, in a period yeah. of like five or six years. 
Do you do you think it's more common than not that some of these startups start out one way and then have a pretty big shift like that when they actually are, you know, have launched and, and start generating revenue? I'm sitting here trying to think of any company that I've been involved with. I'd say the, the vast majority, you know, the vast majority pivot. And, yeah. and they pivot because either market conditions change. I mean, look at COVID. You're a restaurant owner. You have to rethink your oh, business yeah. overnight. You know, and, and those entrepreneurs that are most successful respond to, to different circumstances like that in a way that strengthens the value proposition and leverages it to build, you know, greater long-term value with their customers. Yeah, totally. You know, and I'm so glad you're saying that because I think that, of course, now many businesses have had to pivot. Well, my original idea isn't the one that's going to take off. And so they just kind of put it to the side instead of making that pivot and going, okay, wait a minute, we have a lot here. All we need to do is make certain changes to actually fulfill what, that, what the market is really asking for. Yeah. So this gets me back to this, this piece of if you're an entrepreneur and you're willing to, you know, really ask if you're, if you're, if you have an intention and you're watching what's happening in the marketplace and you can believe that something greater, you know, than yourself is supporting that, but you're paying attention a lot of times that can lead you in that, you know, in that direction yeah. where something you might have seen as a problem or you're a victim to some change actually might be the greatest opportunity sitting right in front of you that you were not, uh, you were not aware of. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I would say you're not a victim. It's an opportunity. <laughs> Correct. Oh, I love this. So do you have, I'm curious because of, you know, all of all of that you do for yourself and for for your mental health and and staying mindful and staying present and doing all these amazing things and i know that you have have your wife which is incredible <laughs> what do you do on a daily basis you you mentioned that you meditate is there anything else that that you do that keeps that keeps you like totally present well, I don't feel like I'm always totally present at all. <laughs> okay. So, so I have tools to bring me back when I realize I'm not present. But, you know, this is, to me, for me, this is like, you know, this is a path. And the, and the question gets more to whether or not I have the self-awareness to understand when I'm not being present. You know, if my mind's wandering, can I bring it back? If I'm on a call, but I'm distracted, then, you know, how do I get myself regrounded in, you know, into that how do I use, you know, how do I use, like, just be present to my breath? My wife actually just launched a course on Inside Timer on conscious breathing. And what, while I knew these, some of these techniques before the course, I've actually taken the course because, because you know, first of all, I was, I was interested because it's my wife. But second of all, it's really interesting to see how conscious are we of our breath. And most people are unconscious breathers. And so even just being present to your breath, that can bring you back into a more grounded and present state. And if you're in that state, I think you can be, you know, more present to, if you're a leader, you're more present to yourself, more present to your employees, more present to your customers. And naturally, if you're, if you're in that state, you're going to be less stressed than if your mind's wandering and racing and trying to do a hundred million things at the same time. Absolutely. I totally agree. Love that. So what is your, what is your next, what is your next big thing or what are you currently working on that's got you super excited? So I'm going to go back to my wife for a second. About three years ago, my wife said to me, or two years ago around then, you know, said, Charlie, you know, you and your group have been investing in the gateway drugs to higher levels of consciousness. And it's time to go deeper. So as an example, we've invested in several platforms. And if I count the number of people that are meditating that weren't meditating before because of the platforms we've invested in, it's probably 100 million people, wow. uh, probably more than that. So, wow. so it's great when we can help you know, people you know, 10 minutes a day of mindfulness and de-stress. 
But our next chapter of investing that you know, we just went through a strategic process is actually to go deeper, to go deeper into how do we transform, you know, people's mental health? How do we go deeper into transforming, you know, the stories that people tell themselves, the trauma that they experience, you know, how can we support people to be more connected to themselves, to their purpose? How can we support the mental health system by exploring like the psychedelic assisted therapy space? How can we support the science of sort of subtle energy or biofield science as a way that, that as human energy systems, if we can prove scientifically that we can actually help to heal each other um, and, and heal ourselves, we can make a great contribution, you know, to health and well-being of people. And, the, and another, you know, another thing we're exploring is really the this, this social wellness. You know, people, there is a loneliness epidemic in our country that's precipitated by, first of all, people being disconnected from themselves. And then secondly, you know, being disconnected from others. And so how can we support more authentic communities, people being more intentional about relationships? So this, you know, this is kind of our next chapter of our investment thesis. And, you know, we're sort of a little out there, you know, as we're, as we're pursuing this, but I'm, I'm really excited because I think we can make, you know, a greater impact on sort of, you know, human conscious evolution, you know, in, in this next chapter. And, and it actually required the first chapter, which is to get, you know, to get people just more present and aware and, you know, and less stressed. Yes. So fantastic. I love all of the the work that you both are doing together. I love that. I love that you're doing it together and and the, the appreciation that, you know, we can hear throughout this whole interview for your wife is so beautiful and so awesome. Hmm. Where can our listeners find more information on, on you and the work that you're doing? So the Bridge Builders Collaborative website is bbcollaborative.com. The, white, the, the work I do for that is through my wife and my business, which is called the Shifted Institute, which is just shifted.com. So our business is about expanding consciousness, inspiring human potential, creating paradigm shifts. I'm also on Medium. I write you know, articles about you know, various things happening in the field. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as well just Charlie Hartwell and you'll find me there. And, you know, those are, those are ways of finding me. And, you know, I've also, I've also got a link to some music videos. So huh. I'm, if, if it's all right, can I share those in our show notes? Oh, you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. This was, this was incredible. It was so, so wonderful speaking with you and, and hearing, you know, all of these, all the incredible things that you're doing, but most importantly, how the, the way that you're, you're doing it all and, mm-hmm. and really staying true to yourself and true to your purpose. And I think that's so inspiring. So I really appreciate you sharing that with our audience today. Well, you're welcome. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you for the time and the conversation. And thank you for you know, supporting more authentic conversations. I appreciate that. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Hey guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already done so, would you do me a favor and go subscribe and review this podcast? My goal is to continue to deliver you content that will really move the revenue needle in your business and give you up-to-date content on anything else that can dramatically help your business. You can also find us at thedrawshop.com slash podcast, where you can comment on the podcast or contact us directly with any issues you'd like me to address. Thanks again. I really, really appreciate you listening and I'll see you next time.